Hey guys, Dave again. So, uh, welcome back. So I've seen a bunch of chatter about this. You guys sent me a bunch of different messages asking me to dive into it. And since winter's finally come to Wyoming and kind of pinned down in the house, I figured I'd dig into it, see what I could find. And if there was something here, we'd do a video on it. So I found more than I expected. So here we are doing a video on this. So let's go ahead and talk about it. So what is it? So back on May 4th, uh, 2020, naturally, uh, Joe Biden out on the campaign trail put forth this sort of out of the blue proposal about a centralized federally run credit reporting bureau. So basically uh, it sent a lot of shocks to a bunch of people but nobody really paid in any mind because they didn't think it would come to fruition. Now we're starting to hear a lot of chatter about it again, starting to see a lot of pickup. You can look in Forbes and a couple other publications and I'll put some links down in the description. You guys can go check all of this out and you can see where I got a lot of this. Uh, so basically let's go through what a credit bureau is, what a credit skewer is, and then we'll talk about sort of what the proposal is. So we'll, so we'll sort of step through it that way. So what's a credit bureau? So basically a credit bureau, there's three major companies that track your credit and sell that to people who give you loans. So credit card companies, banks, those types of, car loans, those types of institutions buy credit scores from these three bureaus. So what are they? So they're TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian. So basically this proposal would replace all of them. So those companies would eventually be phased out. Now a company could still purchase from them, but if you have a centralized federal one that everything's sort of leaning on, I don't see a lot of need for those three. I think they'd become redundant and be gone. So what do they do? They produce a credit score for you. So what's a credit score? A credit score is a number between 300 and 850 that picks a consumer's credit worthiness. The higher the score, the better the borrower looks to potential lenders. A credit score is based on credit history, the number of open accounts, total levels of debt, and your repayment history, as well as a bunch of other factors. Now, there's a factor in there that let's talk about, and it's not really a factor, but race is legally not allowed to be a factor in credit score. So race is out of the mix. Okay. All right. So generally, uh, your credit score can also be known as a FICO score. If you ever hear that or see that in commercials, we're talking about the same thing. So let's run through sort of what are good scores and what are bad scores. And then we'll get into sort of some of the way it's used. We've touched on it a little bit, but we'll get a little bit more in depth. So an excellent score is going to be 800 to 850. A very good score is going to be 740 to 799. Good score is 670 to 739. Fair, 580 to 669. Poor, 300 to 579. If you don't know what your credit score is, I encourage you to go get Credit Karma, not sponsored. You can sign up for that free and they'll give you a rough idea of what your credit score is. So each one of these bureaus produces a different score. So it may not line up perfectly, but it'll get you in the ballpark. Definitely something you should know. All right, how's it used? So a person's credit score, you know, can determine the size of an initial deposit you need to put down if you buy a cell phone, if you get utilities, whether or not you even have to put down a deposit on utilities. Uh, sometimes, you know, your landlord or potential landlord will use it to qualify for rent on an apartment, let's say. Banks will definitely use it as part of their determination for whether or not to give you a loan on a home. Same with cars. So it makes a big difference in your life and it impacts you in a lot of ways. And if you have a really low score, it makes life harder. And if you have a really good score, it makes life better. Fair enough, easy enough. So it's been this way for, for forever, just for super long. So now that we get and understand how sort of credit works and how the banks and lenders and all that use them and it's derived and it comes from these three bureaus, what's Joe proposing? And then we'll get into where Joe's proposal came from. Cause it's, it's not Joe's idea, but Joe's putting it out there and using it and we'll get into what they laid out and, and how it all ties in. Anyway, we'll get there. So basically what happened, and, and I'll tell you who it came from first and then we'll get into their actual hypothesis. So in 2019, there's a think tank called Demos. So Demos put forth this paper and it pro proposed this centralized credit bureau housed within the CFPB, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, creates this public 
registry. So I'm doing air quotes because it matters. Registry, public registry. In talking to the CFPB right now, they're not making a definitive comment on whether or not this is moving forward. But in an article that I found, Amy Traub, and I may be butchering her name, she's the associate director at Demos, said this idea is seriously being considered and discussed within the CFPB. Again, they had no official comment. All right. So what did the demos paper summarize and what did it say? And I encourage you to read this because I'm not giving you the full, all of it. It's, it's too long to just sit here and read to you, but I'm going to read you some big swaths of it so you can get an idea of what's going on. So in the paper, the problem they outlined is this. So basically the problem, credit reports and scores directly impact Americans' economic security and opportunity. Credit history can affect the way Americans are treated by lenders, landlords, utility companies, hospitals, and employers. Having a poor credit history or a thin file with insufficient credit information to generate a credit score can mean a consumer will end up paying more for loans and insurance or have trouble getting them in the first place. Totally true. Misuses of credit history are prevalent and harmful. Job seekers can be denied work, denied work based on their credit history, and the Trump administration has even proposed using credit history to determine whether immigrants should be eligible for permanent residency. I feel like there's some propaganda in there, but we'll move on and go with it. All right, most harmfully, our credit system is built on and continues to reinforce and expand deep racial inequalities. Again, race is not a factor in determining credit score. Generations of discrimination in employment, lending, education, and housing have produced significant racial disparities in credit history. Past discrimination is baked into current determinations of credit worthiness. Credit scores and other lending algorithms disproportionately represent black and Latino loan applicants as riskier customers. As a result, decisions drawing on credit data reproduce and spread existing racial inequality, making it harder to achieve true economic equity. It goes on to say, America's credit reporting system is controlled by three big for-profit companies, Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, true, which collect lending and payment data on 220 million Americans without consumer's permission or approval, and there is no way for consumers to opt out from having personal financial data collected. The algorithms that determine our credit worthiness are not publicly available, and consumers must pay to access their own credit reports and scores beyond one free report from each company per year. Errors are common, and people of color experience higher error rates than white households. Meanwhile, these errors are notoriously difficult to correct, as credit reporting companies have failed to make the investments necessary to investigate disputed items. It is lenders, not American consumers, who are the customers of these companies. Our consumer data is their product, thus these corporations are not accountable to consumers. The companies have no incentive to be concerned about racial equality or fairness. That's the problem as they have outlined it. What's their solution for this proposed problem? Now, the policy solution that they've proposed, Demos proposes establishing a public credit registry housed at the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This publicly run credit registry will gradually replace the current for-profit corporate system and is designed to be responsive to consumer needs and equity concerns rather than the corporate bottom line. A public credit registry will develop algorithms that diminish the impact of past discrimination, deliver transparent credit scoring, provide greater data security, and offer a publicly accountable way to resolve disputes. The use of credit information for non-lending purposes such as employment, housing, and insurance will be curtailed. So this is where I start to question uh, sort of what I believe the motives of this are. So I'm pretty sure to curtail non-lending purposes such as employment, housing, insu and insurance, you'd need some legislation. You can't just stand up a new registry. It's up to the individual entity whether or not what information they want to use to determine whether or not they will lend. So I have some questions and I have some concerns there. We'll go on to where this continues to evolve. So in the solution, they also outline sort of some of the highlights of where this system will be improved over the old system. Now, again, there are multiple more in here that I'm going to highlight. I encourage you to read it so that you can see it and understand it. I will put a link in the description. Okay, so the first one, they say equity. The public credit registry will develop new algorithms for predicting credit worthiness with a goal of minimizing disseparate racial impact. New credit 
New, new credit reporting algorithms could draw on alternative data sources beyond lending when, this, when these data have been shown to be predictive. Alternative data sources. Remember that. And to minimize racial disparities. In addition to drawing on new data sources, the public credit registry will research proposals to exclude certain adverse credit data from credit reports and scores. For example, medical debt or payment delinquencies on predatory loans. The public credit registry will reduce the amount of time that adverse credit information rem remains on a credit report from seven years to four years. Four years is important. Accountability. Consumers will have a right to dispute inaccurate information on their credit report and will be provided free copies of any documents used by the public credit registry to ascertain the accuracy of a disputed item. Consumers will have the right to appeal the results of a dispute and provide additional evidence. As a last resort, con consumers will have the right to sue the public credit registry for failure to fill its responsibilities. So that's their solution. It's this new stand-up CF. PB registry and all the things entailed there. So we're going to look at alternative data sources. We're going to cut it from seven to four years. If you have a if you have a bad mark or a blacklisted, blacklisted comes into play in a second. So if you have any questions on that, I definitely encourage you to read it. It's fairly straightforward. Uh, there is some propaganda in it. Read around it. Read through it. Get the get the facts. Use the links below. So. Sounds, sounds good on the surface. Now, I have some problems with the government having a centralized scoring system for all citizens. Now, it doesn't delve into what the algorithms will base a lot of that on. I don't know that the government should be making financial decisions for private institutions. And I'll give you an example of where a system like this is already in place and already running and I'll give you some highlights of how it's going and what it looks like. And then I'm gonna give you a list of four or five other places where they're starting to implement a very similar system. And I think some of those will really surprise you. So in another country, there's a thing called a social credit system. That other country being China. So let me give you sort of the rundown on what a social credit system is. So there, there's actually multiple social credit systems in China right now. Sort of each state, even down to the city level, has their own. It's layered on layered on layered. But So scholars have conceptualized four different types of systems within China's social credit system. The first, the judicial system, blacklist system for discredited individuals and organizations, a municipal social system, People's Bank of China financial credit system and the commercial credit rating system. So, those exist right now. If you get on one of those lists and you have a black mark, it takes you two to five years, or four years falls right in this mix, to get the removal and possibly do enough what they call remedies to get the mark removed and to move up. And now there's a lot of penalties if you're blacklisted it and have one of these marks. And we'll get into those in, in a little bit. So I'm not gonna run through all of them, but let's go with the judicial system first. So you can see sort of what that's like if you get into this and, you, and it goes wrong. So in 2013, the Supreme People's Court or the SPC of China started a blacklist of debtors with roughly 32,000 names. So the list has since been described as the first step towards a national social credit system by state-owned media. So the state-owned media is telling you this. The SPC also began working with private companies, Alibaba, Tencent, being some of the big ones. So, for example, and I'll give you another one, Sesame Credit. I, I'm not particularly familiar with Sesame Credit, but I understand they're to be quite large within China. So Sesame Credit began deducting points from people who defrauded or who defaulted on court fines. So if you didn't pay your court fees, you started getting dinged and they started tracking it there. China early on tried to use a bunch of private companies to get all this in, but they didn't get the results they want, so they're slowly bringing it in-house and being run by the government. 
In March 2018, Reuters reported that restrictions on citizens and businesses with low social credit ratings and thus low trustworthiness would come into effect on May 1. May 1. This was May 1 of 2018. By the middle of May 2018, several million flight and high-speed train trips had been denied to people who had been blacklisted. Uh, that elevated quickly. Uh, as of March 2019, 13 million people were on the list. All right, so that's the judicial system. So in the judicial system, not paying your fines and a few other things will get you blacklisted and you can't fly, you can't travel by train. You're, you're really sort of locked down to wherever you are. All right, the local government system, which is another one of these underlying systems that they have. Again, based on the same centralized score. Citizens often begin with an initial score to which points are added or deducted depending on their actions. The specific number of points for each action are often listed in publicly available catalogs. If we look back to our demos proposal, it's got a centralized way and publicized way of how you can improve your score. All right, cities also experimented with a multi-level system in which districts decide on scorekeepers who are responsible individual scorekeepers who are responsible for reporting scores to higher ups. Some experiments also allowed citizens to appeal the scores they were attributed. Our demos option allows us to appeal the scores. The government alleges these systems mean to penalize citizens generally agreed as untrustworthy. They claim they will be able to change people's behavior by ensuring they are closely associated with it. The demo system will have a centralized, publicly available score for you. You would be associated with it. Current policies that get you a negative ding on your score. Starting on May 1st, 2016, elderly residents may sue their children and other family members if the latter do not regularly visit the elderly, and courts in Shanghai may rule that the children or other family members must visit the elderly, and if rejected, the children or relevant family members will be blacklisted. Go visit Nana, kids. All right, starting November 1st in 2019, residents at least 14 years old who violated traffic rules such as jaywalking and violating the red light, once caught, will receive a negative record in their credit profiles. For residents under the age of 14, so you parents out there with kids under 14, pay attention to this one, if your kid violates traffic rules, their legal guardians will need to take educational courses or complete certain social services, otherwise a traffic violation will be recorded on your credit profile. Alrighty, so let's see. Starting November 1st, 2019, traffic violations for motor vehicle or moped drivers such such as inappropriate use of high beam and drunk driving may be recorded in your credit profiles. Being drunk on a moped, you get a ding. All right, starting in 2016, 25 types of residents' behavior will cause a drop in their credit scores, including, including cheating on online video games. Do you get a ding if you cheat in an online video game? I'm not making this up. Making reservations at hotels or restaurants but not showing up. Failing to pay cell phone bills promptly. Promptly. Not just not failing, but promptly. Failing to pick up takeout foods when you order them. Uh, on the other hand, positive things that can help you out. If you make a blood donation, you do volunteer work, you can boost your score. So maybe you can make up for some of those not picking up your takeout while you were home cheating on your video games. I don't know. All right, uh, we've got a few more. We'll run through a few more. I thought some of these were fun, so here we go. So starting January 1st, 2017, if you're a dog owner, dog owners lose three points for keeping their dogs off leash in public places, allowing their dogs to disturb other people, not cleaning up after, the, or not cleaning up after their dog. Owners lose another three points on the second offense. They lose all 12 points for the third time and are banned from owning a dog for five years. Five years, no dog. All right, uh, owners will also lose 12 points immediately if their dogs are found unregistered with the government or faulting on annual renewal. Dogs of owners with zero points are confiscated by the government until the owner takes free courses on relevant city rules and passes 
corresponding exams. You have to take an exam to own a dog. Otherwise you get blacklisted and you can't travel. According to the Chinese government, 2015's plan to According to the Chinese government's 2015 plan for implementation, the social, social credit system is due to be fully implemented by 2020. Once implemented, this system will manage the rewards or punishments of citizens on the basis of their economic and personal behavior. Some types of punishment include flight ban, exclusions from private schools, slow internet connection, exclusions from high prestige work, exclusion from hotels, and uh, registration on a public blacklist. So we'll run through a few of these and then I'm going to wrap up and give you some other areas where you're seeing some similar results to this. Again, draw your own conclusions on, on where this heads. So the travel ban as of June 2019, according to the National Development and Reform Commission of China, 26.82 million air tickets as well as 5.96 million high speed rail tickets were denied because people were deemed untrustworthy. If the parents of a child were to score below a certain threshold, their children would be excluded from private schools in the region and even national universities. So if you get too low of a score, your kid, kid can't go to college. Repression of religious minorities. City level pilot projects for the social credit score system have included rewarding individuals for aiding authorities in enforcing restrictions of religious practices, including coercing practitioners of Falun Gong to renounce their beliefs. Uh, I don't really know what that means, but. And reporting on Uyghurs, I, I'm, I'm definitely butchering that and I apologize, who publicly pray, fast during Ramadan, or perform other Islamic practices. Debt collection. So, uh, Hibai Court released an app showing a map of deadbeat debtors. How'd you like to be on the internet as a deadbeat debtor? With, within 500 meters and encourage users to report individuals who they believe could repay their debts. All you, all you cats out there not paying your bills and posting on Instagram with your uh, new Air Jordans or flashy Lambo or whatever you got going on. What? Yeah, watch out. So a spokesman uh, of the court stated that as part of our measures to ensure our rulings and create a social credible environment. Socially credible environment, sorry. All right, public display. Mug shots of blacklisted individuals are sometimes displayed on large LED screens or buildings, on buildings, excuse me, large LED screens on buildings or shown before the movie in movie theaters. How'd you like to go to the movie theater and your image packs up, uh, posts up because you're on a blacklist? Oh my God, all right. So that's, I'm not saying that that's where we're headed or that's what's coming, or that's what this system even is. But the government have a, having a centralized scoring system is bad. This is an example of a government with a centralized scoring system, and these are the things that are happening there. So, do we go there? I hope not. Do I think we're going there? I hope not. Is it immediate? No. But it's been proposed. And again, I want you guys to know about things that the government's talking about and things that are being proposed and how they're implemented elsewhere so we can see sort of the pathway of what it looks like. Now let me give you four more examples of where this is being implemented and I think some of these are gonna surprise you and then I'll let you go with this and draw your own conclusion and I'm sorry this video is a little long. So the first one is Chile. So since the early days of the Pinochet, Dick, Dick, Pinocchio, Pinochet, Pino, Pinocchio, I don't know. Since the early days of the dictatorship, a Directory of Commercial Information, the DICOM, Directory of Commercial Information, has featured prominently in the economic life of the country. People who have poor DICOM scores find it harder to find housing, start new businesses, get loans. They're not intended the usage of the system. They can't find jobs either, since employers check the scores as part of the selection process. Now the demos piece says that that's supposed to be excluded, but without legislation that doesn't that doesn't happen by just creating a registry so here's an example in chile where employers are using this centralized system that they have in place to impact your ability to get a job so understand here's another example of where this is being used second country where it's uh, being implemented germany in february 2018 so not long ago two years ago this month 
Uh, I'm not even going to try to represent the name. <laughs> you can see it in Wikipedia. Uh, it's a, a global um, newspaper there in Germany. Handles Blatt. I don't know. Good luck. I guess that's how it's pronounced. Reported that Germany may be sleepwalking towards a system comparable to China's. Using data from the Universal Credit Rating System, geolocation, and health records to determine access to credit and health insurance. This is Germany. That's an ally in the European Union. All right, Fed, ECB. Yeah, ally, doing a very similar thing. Okay. Third example, even closer ally, bigger ally, been an ally for a long time. The United Kingdom, yeah, the, the UK, in 2018, the New Economics Foundation compared the Chinese citizen score to other rating systems in the United Kingdom. These included using data from a citizen's credit score, phone usage, rent payment, and so on to filter job applications, to, to determine access to social services, and to determine advertisements served. That's the whole ball of watch right there. And that's the UK. <clears throat> and then the last one. So this one's a little bit less surprising. I think for me, the UK was the most staggering one that I saw and how this is eerily similar. But the last one's Venezuela. So in 2017, Venezuela started developing a smart card, a smart ID card known as the Carne de la Patria or Fatherland card. All right, with the help of the Chinese telecom company, ZTE. The system included a database which stores details like birthdays, family information, employment and income, property owned, medical history, state benefits received, presence on social media, membership of a political party, and whether a person voted. Many in Venezuela have expressed concern that the card that the card in an attempt to tighten social control through monitoring all aspects of daily life. So I bring up Venezuela, not because it's a surprise, but because I'm working on something else that I'm hoping to tie together to further expand on this. So we'll get into some of this. There's a lot of pieces that tie together. There's a lot of proposals out there that tie together. A centralized scoring system is bad. I don't think we should be ranking citizens, and I don't think the government should be doing it. While the system now is not perfect, I think the bigger issue, and this is just my opinion, lies in the lack of financial education in schools as to why there's probably a discrepancy in credit scores. You tend to find families that come from money teach children about money. Families that don't come from money don't talk about money. Money's often not discussed. I think that's the bigger problem. I think we need school reform, not a centralized credit bureau. I think the centralized credit bureau leads us down a bad path. If you agree with me, awesome. If you don't agree with me, that's awesome too. Not a conspiracy theory. I just wanna hear you guys' thoughts. When I read this and I saw this and I looked at what's going on in the world, these are where the pieces led me. Make your own decisions. I'll put links to the uh, material that I used to pull all this together down there so you guys can read it and make your own decisions. I encourage you to read it. I encourage you to check it out. Uh, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a read. So, I don't know. Until the next one, let's hope the weather gets warm so I can do some outside videos for you guys so you stop having to hear me talk. I'll catch you, in the guys, next, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Be safe.